709, Bonnie and Friends, WDAY Radio, coming to you live from the Bell Bank Studios. Bonnie Mastati, Jeff Left, and joining us now on the phone, we have Lee Hodel of Fargo. He's got a big uh, expedition coming up. He climbs mountains, I think, for fun. Maybe he makes a living climbing mountains. I'm not sure. He's sponsored. He's, <laughs> he's joining us now on Bonnie and Friends. Good morning to you, Lee. Morning, Lee. Good, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Is no this, this is just a hobby of yours, right? It's a hobby for you? Well, I think it went past a hobby into a passion. But, yeah, it, it has been. A, it's, no, I don't make money off of it. How long have you been doing this? When was your first climb? What year? About 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And wow. you've, you've got a big one coming up. And Mount Rainier, have you done that before? Yes. I've, uh, we've climbed it from three different directions so far, um, different teams that I've been with. And uh, we've summited each time. We've been very lucky. The mountain was very kind to us. This time I'm going with my uh, 24-year-old son. He's cutting his teeth on wow. climbing. He wants to do it, so it'll be our, his first time. Couldn't now, you have taken him out to, like, Devil's Tower or somewhere smaller? Yeah, right. He chose uh, Mount Rainier, or has he done uh, enough climbing, like, in the gym and on shorter mountains? Well, we've taken our entire family uh, on vacations to national parks, and uh, we've done a lot of hiking together. So he's, re- he's prepared. He's strong. He's been, in a, he's been in his fitness center working out on the treadmill, elevated in packs. and So, yeah, so, so I looked up Mount Rainier because that's the one you're going to tackle. And uh, it's uh, it's 21st in the world's most prominent peaks, fourth in North America, the fourth highest. At 14,417, do you need oxygen up there or no? Well, it depends on if, uh, you know, you'll find people that will be on vacation. They'll go into the, into the mountains, they'll go into glacier or whatever, and they might get 8,000 feet, and they, you can get really lightheaded. I haven't. I've been very fortunate not to suffer from uh, high-altitude sickness. So, no, we haven't. In fact... Uh, we've, we summited Mount McKinley. I summited that in 2012 and that was 20,000 feet. And I think on your list, probably they're the number one in North America or North and South America is Akangawa in Argentina. That's 23,870, yes. something like that. Feet. And some change. We summited that one without any oxygen. So let me ask you this. Um, the Broncos play in Denver and even players get kind of crazy with, you know, that elevation, but I don't even know what that elevation, that's nowhere near 14,000 feet. Well, that's mile, that, you know, they call it mile high stadium. Right. And so the peaks that we're on are, are almost three miles vertical. Oh my God. How did, how did you, do, I, am I calling it right when I say mountain climbing? Is that, is that what it's called or is there a different technical? They'll call it, sure. They'll call it alpine climbing. They'll call it uh, mountain climbing, mountaineering, but uh, anything above 17,000 feet is considered um, extreme high altitude climbing. Okay. How did you get involved in this? And did you have a mentor who kind of helped show you the ropes? No, my father was one that was in the Marine Corps for 24 years. So he, when we were growing up, when we were little, we were always going out on maneuvers. We were always hiking. We were always winter camping and things like that. So that, you know, being in the outdoors was just a, it's always been a passion of mine since I was a kid. I just absolutely love nature. I'd like to spend more time in a tent than I would in a, in a house in a given year. And, uh, I was running in high school and then started marathoning past college and ran. I don't know how many marathons I ran before I decided, you know, I've got to try something different because it's starting to get a little bit old. Like right now I've run 98 marathons and it's, you know, it gets a little bit, that part of it gets a little bit old, the training you're on the flat land. And so I just went out to Rainier. I went out there and hooked up with uh, some climbing experts and they got me literally roped in and, Showed me the ropes, <laughs> roped it, so to speak. So like yeah, it. and it's the most glaciated peak in uh, in the contiguous United States. In oh, really? Oh, Forty-eight. Yeah, it's got 25, 27 glaciers on it. So will it's most massive. of your will most of your climbing be done on ice as opposed to rock? We'll go once we get above six thousand. It'll all be on ice. Oh my uh, gosh! Is uh, is mom a little concerned for your son? You know, it's we always talk about it at home. Walking out your door this morning, getting into your car is a calculated risk. It just is. Mm-hmm. If you don't keep your eyes open, you look in both ways in the intersection. People drive through it like somebody did just yesterday. Ran mm-hmm. through a red light, and we, I paused, and they shot through. Everything's a calculated risk. So even up on there, I won't put him in a situation where um, I don't think he's safe. But, again, nothing in life is completely safe. You bet. Um, he, knows, he knows the risks that are involved. I mean, we're going to be going across... Uh, around crev- crevasses, we're going to be passing Ciroc fields and 
uh, beyond exposed rock for a portion of it called the disappointment cleaver where you're kind of scrambling hand over foot with your ice axe in your hand. And then we get up to high break and that's about 13,000 feet. That's when it's, it's just some winding back and forth, you know, uh, trail that in the snow, that's probably about two feet wide. Okay. So when you reach the top, okay. So when the <laughs> entire party reaches the top, are you choppered off? I mean, there's no glory in coming down. Why come down hard? I, if you're going to go all the way up, you know, can it be easy getting off the thing, you know? <laughs> can it be easy getting off of it? Well, I mean, well, shouldn't we'll, it be easy? You know, Or do you have to walk all the way down again? No, you come all the way down. No, or you, or you say choppered off. No, no, no. We, we actually, uh, when we talk about it, Steve, and I've already told my son this, when we get into the, if and when we get into the crater, and then we have a, about a half hour walk across the crater and up over into what they call the, the highest point of that peak, which is called uh, Columbia Crest. And then you can see everything from there. You can see it, everything from the crater anyway. Wow. We'll spend about a half hour and it's what I'll tell my son is uh, we're only halfway down. We're only halfway done. You know, it's like you don't swim out half a mile and not expect to, you're going to have to swim back. that extra right. Half a mile, right. right. And so we just take our time. And, and coming down is a little bit easier, especially as you start getting more and more oxygen. On Rainier, I think it's it's about a third less oxygen from, from sea level. Mm. So you start you start filling your lungs. And I've taught him, and we'll we'll go over all the techniques of pressure sure. breathing, and uh, how to rest step so that you're not legs out and burning up all your calories. Well, and when, speaking of your lungs, now Lee, tell our listeners you had quite a battle with COVID. What about a year and a half ago, and your lungs were pretty heavily damaged, and, and where you're at in terms of recovery? Yeah, it was in uh, just before Thanksgiving of 2020, and it took me about a year and a half. When we, I went in, I was I skirted the hospital because uh, they were filled, so I ended up in the emergency room four different times within two months. My oxygen, my O2 level was 80, 86. Anything below 90, it starts to become consistent. Um, I was taking steroids, had me on uh, the special BAM infusion in plasma uh, to induce antibiotics. And uh, I don't know, the research is not out there, but a lot of my running friends, climbing friends, some even succumbed to the, the, come to the, the virus. Um, we were, almost all of us were A positive blood type. So there's some there's some research out there to support the fact that a positive type uh, can tend to be more uh, vulnerable to it and can it can be more fatal. So when I about a month into um, this and I went in, they scanned my lungs and the doctor said it looked like somebody had taken glass and just shredded it, just broke it up into a fine powder and then sprinkled it across my lungs. The whole screen lit up um, and it was scarring. And part of it is when that when that occurs then your body can't, your lungs can't work fully, so you're not getting in a ton of oxygen. Because of that, that's the first place it goes is to your brain, right? So you hear a number of patients, a number of people with long-term effect talk about brain fog with this, with the coronavirus, where they forget things. I would be sitting at my computer working for doing video projects that I do with my own company, and I, two hours would go by, and I'd be staring at my screen, didn't even know it. Mm. those kind of things. So it took about a year and a half. I, it was, it's been a slow process, but uh, you know, I, when I was in, in June, the doctor took another look and he said, they're clean. They're, they're good. You're good. So that's awesome. And yeah, you've been, amazing. Uh, you've been uh, using uh, the, uh, the bleachers over at Fargo Shanley to do some training here before <laughs> you go on your expedition. Yeah. You know, when, when I went to climb in, in South America and Argentina, I just, I would go back and forth with a backpack about 50, 60 pounds it would vary. I do it in a three-month period, so 40 pounds the first month, 50 the second, and 60 the last month before I, we head out for our climb. And the only place there was anywhere close, because I didn't want to drive all the way downtown to find a set of stairs or a parking structure, so I would just go over the, 50, uh, the 52nd Avenue overpass, just back and forth, back mm-hmm. and forth, in the wintertime in that year. And it just didn't seem to do the same thing. So when we, uh, we ramped up to climb Kilimanjaro, in that in January of 2020, I started in October, and uh, I had four kids that attended Chan- Shanley and uh, just asked the uh, the president and the athletic director if I could use the, the the stadium. And so I would put on that strap on that pack at 4 a.m. and go back up and down the stairs for two hours each day. Hmm. Um, Lee- and same thing. Oh yeah, it worked. It worked on Kilimanjaro. That that peak was a breeze, and that was 19. So this one, yeah, I think we're ready. It was a breeze. 
Uh, well. So I just looked it up. <laughs> I, do you guys, do you check with like a uh, geologist? Because I just saw here, it's one of the l- large strata volcanoes in the Cascade Range, about 50 miles, 50 miles uh, south uh, east of Seattle. Like, is it mm-hmm. active in that respect? Do you do you know? Yeah, it's one of the most it's one of the most active volcanoes in oh. in the United States, probably if not the most. It's actually overdue to blow, but it's there's oh. right, right now. There's uh, by about 588 years or something like that. When we get up there, there you'll see over on the edges, around the edges, there's fumaroles that are coming up. So you know, underneath it's still it's still boiling. It's still Gee. active, but it's right now it's dormant. To if, the top. Um, if it's that if it, hot, well, how come it's got an ice cap on it? I think it'd melt for God's sake. But I because guess because of the because of the weather out there, every every uh, storm that comes in, you know, Seattle just gets inundated with oh, rain. Oh yeah, yeah, Oregon, yeah, and Washington. And so when it's raining at sea level, it's snowing above six thousand feet. Oh. So it's constantly adding more and more snow up there. This summer's been tough because you know the heat here in the United States has been has been tremendous and. It, particularly, uh, well, through the southeast, but also up into the northwest. And so they haven't had that much snow, and so there's been a lot of melting up there. Mm-hmm. And to be honest with you, if that, if that Mount Blue, um, you'll read reports that'll say it'll make Mount St. Helens look like a baby. Oh, oh my. Really? Oh, my. Oh. Okay, so when do because, you, whoops, I was going to say, when do you and the, your son start your journey, and how long does it take to do the climb and come back down? We'll fly out on the 23rd. We get acclimated to base camp on the 24th. Meet up with our team, do all of our introductions. We'd spend the 25th. That's Friday. Friday? I can't remember. No, Thursday of the 25th. We'll uh, we'll spend our time going up above uh, 6,000 feet up into the snowfield, near snowfield, and we'll do a lot of our training. And that's ice axe arrest, roping, tying in, traversing, all of those things we need to know. Um, avalanche rescue. Um, we always have avalanche beacons. That's always a possibility. Um, and then we'll come back down, get everything packed up, and we'll leave on Friday morning at about 9 a.m. We'll go up uh, through the main, the, the paved trail up until 6,000 feet. We'll switch out into climbing boots and crampons, and then we'll take the mere snowfield up to 10,000 feet. We'll get there about 3 p.m. on Friday, rest, eat dinner, get to bed, and then like about 6 p.m. And about midnight, we'll wake up and suit up. And then it's headlamps and and uh, helmets and crampons and harnesses and ropes, and then we start climbing. And we'll climb. We'll go across the Calus Glacier up the Cathedral Gap, the Ingram Flats, which is basically a Ciroc field, up the Disappointment Cleaver into High Break. And hopefully, if everything goes well and the weather's nice, we'll get up to. We'll see this. We'll be at the summit somewhere between seven and nine a.m. Wow, oh, Lee, this take... is fantastic. Yeah. This really is. We'll have to touch base with you uh, after you're done and, and, yeah. and find out how everything went. But uh, we we wish you and your son the best of luck. Uh, have a great father-son bonding experience. And thanks for sharing your, your story and your adventure with us this morning, Lee. We appreciate it. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, you bet. Lee Hodel joining us here on Bonnie and Friends. I think that's what you call not only endurance, but extreme sports enthusiast as well, oh, yeah, right? No doubt. That is super cool. Yep. It is 723 Bonnie and Friends, WDAY Radio, coming to you live from the Bell Bank Studios. WDAY Ag Director Bridget Riedel is standing by. She joins us next. Are you suffering from... 